The critical care physician is a specialist in diagnosing, monitoring, and managing the most seriously ill patients, most of whom have life-threatening conditions. Our guest on this week's Health Talk is a critical care expert who directs the ICU at Norwalk Hospital. She'll be discussing her experiences caring for the critically ill and injured. So stay tuned. We're up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Andrea Peterson. And I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today we're going to discuss the care of the critically ill patient. Our guest is Dr. Robin Scatina. She's a director of the Critical Care Medicine at Oral Hospital. She's a specialist in pulmonary and critical care medicine. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. What an exciting field, critical care medicine. You, you're really dealing with the, the sickest of the sick. You get to bring people back to life. You also deal with a lot of death. So tell why did you choose critical care? Um, I chose critical care because it represented to me the best parts of medicine. I think to me a good doctor is someone who thinks and puts together puzzles but also acts in ways to help their patients. And perhaps it satisfied an impatience in my soul that I got to do all of that in two hours <laughs> <laughs> and think and quickly apply uh, what I thought might be the right approach to a problem and see kind of in real time if we were able to make the patient better or not. That was the initial thing that pulled me into the intensive care unit. The care of critically ill patients is, is often guided by a lot of research and, and evidence too and, and I, I'm sure that in your career already you've seen a lot that's changed in critical care approaches to patients. Maybe mm -hmm. you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I remember as a fellow we were trialing new drugs for improving outcomes in sepsis and um, the application of drugs that looked really good. Some people call sepsis blood poisoning, it's bacteria in, in the system causes multi-organ failure. Horrible infections that make people really sick and so there, I remember we trialed a medicine that looked really good in uh, kind of early studies and then when we applied it to population at large it actually didn't help at all. So. Uh, I think at that time we were really trying to find the fix for people who were critically ill. And it, certainly there's still a lot of research directed at that, but what's been uh, exciting and inspiring to me as a director of the intensive care unit now is the attention that's focused back on um, the basics, I think, of being human in the ICU. So... Now, I just want to preface this <laughs> and preface your remark. It's really interesting what's happened is that critical care unit may be one of our most high-tech places, and yet a lot of the recent work has been in low-tech areas of yeah. how to improve. Well, you tell us that, those, those low-tech But I think it's amazing how the focus has changed. Yeah, so uh, some of the things that we've been devoting our energy to are um, helping people sleep in the ICU, knowing that getting sleep for six or eight hours with minimal interruptions improves their health and will speed their recovery. Uh, now, some of our viewers might even be surprised about that because they might think that all the patients in the ICU are sedated. and. And right. what do you do about sleep in a sedated patient? Right, so good point. Um, maybe 10, 15 years ago, many of the patients in the ICU who were on breathing machines were sedated and really wouldn't wake up until we let them wake up. Um, we know now that that actually made them sicker for longer, that they weren't able to recover and get out of the ICU as quickly, and they weren't able to get back to their lives as quickly as possible. So we now employ uh, strategies that help to minimize sedation, that we make people comfortable when they need it. We treat their pain and we treat their anxiety, but we don't just put them to sleep to make it easier to care for them. And so you mean even patients who are on machines that are helping them breathe can be awake? Yeah, absolutely. For the most part, there is a rare patient who just for whatever reason can't tolerate it and we'll do whatever we need to to make them comfortable, but people do better if they're able to be awake and participate in their care. Which I've read a lot about delirium in the mm -hmm. ICU patient that, that 40, 50, 60 percent, enormous percentage of patients actually become delirious. Yeah. Uh, how, what are we doing to prevent, prevent the, that psychological stress? Sleep must help. <laughs> Sleep definitely helps. Mobility helps. Actually getting people out of bed, sitting up in a chair if they can, walking if they can, even standing next to the bed and Which marching. Which was unheard of 20 years ago. The idea of people like you're walking around with a breathing machine attached. Yeah, so that, that would it's have really been incredible. Again, a sea change in, yeah. in how we are taking care of critically ill patients. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. What other things are you doing to, to change the experience of the ICU patient? So one of the things that 
is really important is engaging patients and their families in their own care. Um, so, uh, you know, back in my training and maybe even just before my training, it was really a practice of the medical team standing inside the room or outside of the room, making decisions, just telling the nurse what the decision was, and then walking away and letting the patient family member catch up with everything later. Um, so we know that uh, patients and their families are more satisfied with their care and that actually oftentimes doctors and nurses are more satisfied th with the care when we do it collaboratively. So we try to involve patients and families as they're able in uh, care discussions. Um, we try to explain what we're doing, try to give patients and families ways that they can participate. Um, for example, if a p family member can help with a bath in the ICU, we're really happy to do that. Um, if they can help to moisten somebody's mouth if they're on the ventilator. Um, it's fulfilling and it it kind of puts us all together on the same team and achieving the same goals. How about making complex medical decisions? I would think that would be an enormous challenge because families are obviously upset. They are, mm -hmm. they, it may, this may be something that just happened and their relative was well. They're grasping for life. How do you help them deal with, with those difficult decisions, especially interventions that may have low probability of success yeah. uh, and will definitely make the patient uncomfortable? So I think there's two things that are very important to me when I approach difficult situations with patients and their families and when I teach residents about how to do that. I think the first one is to remember that who we see in the bed is not who the patient's family sees. That we see a sick person and the patient's family sees somebody who is active and able in their lives. And whether they were able two days ago or two years ago, they still were that person. Uh, and that's their memory. And so I think meeting the family where they are um, and with the conception that they have of their loved one is first. Um, it really helps when patients, family members bring in pictures um, that uh, demonstrate to us the person um, that we're caring for in the bed, things that we wouldn't know about somebody. And in the same way, uh, when we have discussions about what patients would like in their care, I think it's important to ask what was important to them, what did they like doing, what were their favorite things, and what made them the happiest. Um, so we can try to get a sense of who this person is, not just kind of who this heart and lungs and kidney function. Um, are so and then the other thing is that to me I'm, I don't tend to approach most problems mathematically although that seems funny as an ICU director but to me there's kind of a math of making decisions about complex care and the the two data points are what's the likelihood that I can achieve a goal and how much do I have to go through to achieve that goal? And so I, um, I think some patients will do absolutely everything that they can to get better, no matter how much they need to go through. And no matter how uncomfortable some of the things they need to go through are. And some patients say, no way, I don't want that. I just want to be comfortable. And I'd rather have fewer days if they're more comfortable. And then the other thing that I think is important uh, to ask is, what is your goal? Are you really comfortable just laying on the couch, maybe sitting up having a conversation with your family, or are you somebody who needs to be out doing shopping, running marathons? Um, so I think there's kind of a calculus. How much can you go through and where do you need to be? And there may be particular life circumstances that are in play at that, at that moment. So if there's an important event Absolutely. coming up or something that someone's waiting for, a baby to be born, a wedding, that can mm -hmm. alter what their goals might be as opposed to a different point in time in their lives. Definitely, and I think in my um, so far short career, I've been lucky enough to see patients through some of those important events. I remember uh, one wedding we were able to arrange in the intensive care unit for somebody who had few days to live but really needed to see their daughter get married. How you know, lovely. It was amazing, it was totally amazing. Do, do families ever ask you what you would do in their position? Yeah, they do, and, and I think that's a difficult question to answer as a doctor. I think we've, uh, We've been taught to not impart our own values on uh, patients and their families, but at the same time, I think one of the most important roles that we play in society is uh, to bridge science and um, humanity and to kind of translate what we know about medicine into things that are relevant um, for people making real life decisions. So I, I actually try to answer when I could and always explain that my values are such that you know, I place a high value on um, spending time with my family or something so that people can understand where I'm coming from, but I try not to shy away entirely. But I know I've seen recent research that shows that doctors die differently from non-doctors. That I don't know whether you've seen that, but I we, haven't. we use as a group far less interventional care at the end of life 
than the non-physician world does. And I, perhaps we have a better feeling for near feudal care. Futility is, I know, a big argument, but uh, the idea of near feudal care, so we're not dealing with absolutes. Uh, we've, we've seen so many times that it becomes a burden and not a blessing to the patient that I think we as a group tend to use it less than the, uh, the lay people. Because I think people deal very, very poorly with uh, relative risk and probabilities. It, it's, it's a hard concept when you're dealing with a, a binary decision. I think so, and I think some of the challenges for us as doctors is that there's so much uncertainty, and we don't know oftentimes exactly if somebody's going to get better or not, and how many days it'll take for them to get better. Um, and I, I think one of the things I've learned um, <laughs> through my few years of practicing is to uh, kind of accept the uncertainty and to share that uncertainty with family members. And you're right, it doesn't make for cleanly packaged decisions, um, but I think it's more honest and realistic. And you said some people will say, I don't want to live like that ever. Yeah. But there are cultures that are very different than ours, where they believe that any life is, and by our, our personal culture, I'm just mm. assuming as physicians, but uh, I think uh, some of the uh, Orthodox Jewish religions believe that life at any cost is, is sacred, and therefore you prolong life until you absolutely cannot anymore. So I think we have to respect that in our patients as well. Yeah, we do, and I think that's part of asking patients and their families what's important to them yeah. and what are their goals. Because to me, uh, feudal care is maybe perhaps better called non-beneficial care, and non-beneficial care, care that doesn't benefit someone, is care that doesn't help them meet their goal. And anybody could have uh, any number of goals while they're in the mm -hmm. ICU. We try to help them meet those. I, do, I found, I'm sorry, I'll keep stumbling okay. over Andrew here. It's okay, uh, when You're I was doing a, a lot of topic. oncology, I found, and I just, I'm asking you to comment on this, and both, and both of you, because I think it, I don't know whether it was right or not, but I know when I felt that a patient had reached, we'd reached the end of any kind of meaningful therapeutic intervention, I would tell them that if this were I, I, I would stop hoping to remove some of the burden mm -hmm. of, of disconnecting from the patients, because mm -hmm. I, I never wanted them to think, well, you know, mom could have lived longer if only you hadn't pulled the plug. So. I'll pull the plug, hmm. and then I'll help you pull the plug. Uh, how, what do you think about that? You know, it sounded like you do that sometimes. I think it can be really therapeutic to explain things um, medically, meaning, you know, given what's going on, the likelihood of your mother walking out of the hospital is very low. And if she said she wouldn't want to stay here, then you're only helping her to achieve the things that she wanted, that you're not giving up on her that we're just helping her um, approach her care the way she would have wanted. And in that, we have about 30 seconds left. Maybe you can mention, is it a blessing when patients and families have discussed what they would Thank want you, together before they get to the point of the ICU? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that takes so much burden and stress away from the family members who have to make decisions because really they only have to remember what somebody told them is important to them. And we're able to put that together, apply it to the situation. Honor um, that person. Yeah, and make decisions that the person would have made if they could speak. Right? I think it's so much more meaningful. That's Thank really you so much. Yeah, that's so helpful. It, it's so hard uh, living at that age. Let me just ask you, uh, physician-assisted suicide. <laughs> this is a controversial <laughs> political issue, but it certainly comes up in your world, came up in my world. Mm. Uh, 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 I guess we don't have enough time to talk about that today. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> may, maybe we'll do that another day, because I think that's a, so, something that I think is very, very difficult. Uh, anyway, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Thank you for we want to thank. Here. Robin Scatino for coming on the show today and uh, joining this very important discussion. Thank if you, you have questions or comments for us, please do send them to us at healthtalk at wchn.org. Thanks for watching. Be well.